So welcome everyone to the SoCal Sewing Court Chat for this evening's talk. And this evening we are honored and pleased to have Dan Ryan doing a tech talk on something that's pretty new technology in the world of varios. So, and he's been using the LXNAB Hawk Vario for uh, about a season. And he's going to give us a review and go pretty deep into the technology and the, the how to's and where's and the, the what you can really get out of using this new technology. Um, so before I have uh, Dan begin, let me give you a little quick background on Dan. Uh, God, Dan been he's been flying since uh, knee hydro grasshopper. He sold it at age fourteen, he in, in gliders, and then at age sixteen he sold it in power. And then moving right along, he uh, got his license in power at 17. And then the following year, he got his commercial license at age 18. Um, so he, he really dove right in deep there at the beginning of his young life. Um, and now he holds three diamonds, a single Lenny pin, and has achieved the 750 kilometer distance. So those are those are quite pretty, pretty uh, remarkable achievements as a soaring pilot, as, as many of you know. Um, the other couple things that I've learned about him is he's also an International Aerobatic Club Special Achievement Award recipient. So that's that's no nothing to shake stick at. <laughs> so, um, and on top of that, he is the Wright Brothers 50 Years Pilot Achievement. So I think Dan's been around soaring for quite a while. And I think most of you on this platform probably already know Dan or you know flown with Dan. So with that, I will turn it over to you and take it away, Dan. Thank you, Christopher. And uh, see a lot of familiar faces on the uh, little icons here. Uh, good evening. So this is a pretty new and exciting uh, technology that LX Nav came out with. Um, actually, back in 2021, it really didn't get fully used by a lot of people until 2022. Uh, they call it a hawk. and um, it's, it's pretty unique in the uh, history of variometers, and that's what I'll go through tonight, is sharing a little bit about it in several different ways. Um, some of the things that it can do, uh, some of the um, uh, theory behind it, all of that good stuff that you are all dying to know. So a description of the Hawk and LXNAV system is probably the best place to go is to the Cumulus Soaring uh, website. Uh, Paul Remdy has got a whole uh, page just set up to try to teach you everything he can about Hawk. A lot of videos are also included there. And you don't have to write this down because at the end I'm gonna, and I think um, uh, Christopher's gonna put out the, uh, uh, all of the websites that I'll be talking about. There's gonna be several of them tonight. So there's gonna be a handout that you can go in on your own and learn all about these, um, the hawk and on the various websites that I'm going to be showing tonight. But that's a good place to start. And then um, you also have to get into the hardware requirements for the um, to to use hawk. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that and also the various variometers that stand alone that can use it. That's pretty, uh, pretty nice as well. And then I'm going to show some uh, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the videos, I should say, that uh, of using Hawk, setting it up, and then some expert comments. Uh, G. Dale uh, did a really nice uh, series of comments on the uh, Wings and Wheels blog. Morgan Hall did some nice comments on the, uh, there's actually, I should have put this in there as well. I realized that just now. Uh, there is a Google's group, Google group, uh, Hawk group, and Morgan Hall made some comments on that. And then I'm going to show some pictures uh, in sight that I had, uh, or in flight, I should say, of using uh, Hawk, and it also couples it with SkySight. So you'll get to see all of that as we go for, further into the briefing. So what is Hawk? Well, back in the center here, you can see this was a Siegelflügen magazine, and it was a great write-up. It was all in German, and it came out in April 9th, 2021, and right away, all the Americans went and tried to decipher it all and understand it. 
And there were some pretty crummy, uh, <laughs> even I tried to, using Google Translate to try to see if I could understand it. But there were um, a couple of them that were pretty close. Fortunately, there was an English version that came out right after it over on the left-hand side. And it went into a lot more detail of what Hawk is. And I think that's also the same one that was uh, published in Gliding International uh, quite a bit later, though, in uh, February 2021. So those are good places where you can see what it is. In a, in a nutshell, it is a sensor unit that's using GPS, static and dynamic pressure, inertial measurement unit, and then a processor to show you what where the lift is and how much lift you have. Very different from a total energy probe, as you'll see. So last um, February, Paul Remedy put together a really nice webinar. And it was pretty interesting because uh, the fellow who designed and created Hawk, uh, Heinrich Meyer, I think I believe he's Dr. Heinrich Meyer, uh, he was in Switzerland and he was on this webinar. Same time, real time, was Tony Sabak from uh, LXNAV. Tony's um, not only an LXNAV uh, representative, he's also a competition pilot. He flies an Arcus in the 20 meter class in, uh, in Europe, flies a lot of contests over there, speaks perfect English. I've spoken with him many times and uh, conversed with him many times. So he's a user. So he was good to have into this, uh, this presentation as well. And it, this uh, webinar is on Paul's, uh, on the Cumulus Soaring, Paul Remdy's uh, website. So I highly recommend you look at it if you haven't already. It's pretty long. It's a couple hours. It really gets into detail. And you can see on the right, I, I just grabbed some screenshots here of some of the things he's talking about. And, you know, he gets into all of this crazy math over here on the right and stuff that I'm not even going to try to attempt to uh, describe. But what he's describing is is basically how he's going to use all of the inputs he's getting out of the inertial measurement unit and then filtering it out to only show lift. That's in a, in a nutshell. But it's, uh, it's interesting understanding what it is. And then, of course, you want to learn how to use the darn thing. Fortunately, uh, by the way, uh, Dr. Meyer is a, uh, a glider pilot. He has a ASH 25 MI, as I recall. So the benefits of Hawk are three key features. As I've already mentioned, uh, it has an inner, inner, inertial measuring unit. That's how you're going to be able to see the instantaneous winds, which is very important. The vario needle is also IMU based, and it will truly show the lift by filtering out all of the gusts. And that's what um, is a is a big um, feature that Dr. Meyer uh, is, talks about in his uh, in his webinar. And then you also have an uh, AHARS altitude heading reference system. And this is a new one. It's a little different than the one that, uh, that LXNAV put out previously. I had the one previously uh, in my LX9000 and it uh, turned out I had to start all over, which I'll talk about later. But um, those are the three key features that you get when you get an LX9, or uh, sorry, a, a Hawk system. So let's get into the hardware a little bit. This, uh, the LX nav systems, there's several, there's the 8,000, the 9,000 series. These are the ones that are the displays. The 9,000 is pretty popular, it's what I have. And to yeah, have Hawk with that, you have to have a fourth generation or greater um, of, of the eight or 9,000 series uh, displays. Unfortunately, I found out right about this time that I had a third generation display. So I was in a dilemma as to how to get Hawk, which I'll talk about a little bit more. But the good thing is, is that if you have uh, beyond a fourth generation of any of these systems, you can get a free 31 day trial of Hawk. And I've worked with several people that have tried that and it works out pretty well. And how you can find out what generation you're, say you already have a LX system and you don't know what generation is, you just go to the setup and about and you can see it there, it'll, it'll pop right up. And that was a sad day for me when I found that out and went down to the hangar and popped it up, Gen 3. Mm. <laughs> Not what I wanted to see. If you have a uh, S100 or an S10, these are the two standalone uh, variometers that, um, 
Alex puts out, it will work in either of these two right off the bat. You don't need a later generation. They work just fine. And I thought about trying to use an S10 because I couldn't, uh, I couldn't use what I had in my LX9000. But unfortunately, I didn't really have the panel space to add another variometer into my panel. But um, I first gave this, this uh, presentation at the Parowan um, soaring camp last June. There were several guys there that had uh, S100 uh, standalone varios. And so they tried to, you know, downloaded it. We tried it. And I think I had three different guys that I helped uh, put it into their system. And it worked fine. They flew it the next day and they loved it. I think they all went on to ultimately buy it. So the free trial does work quite well. And uh, they were happy. So what do you see in flight? I'm going to start over on the right-hand side because this is what it would look like on a standalone Vario. This happens to be my uh, V8 Vario, but it's a later generation. But what you see relative to the glider icon is the wind and the direction and the speed. And the instantaneous is in um, dark blue. So that's this guy right here. The lighter is the average wind. Now the needles in blue are the Vario from Hawk. Red is from the TE probe. I'm gonna talk a lot more about that later. And if you have a V8 like this, and you also have an LX9000, you can put in various nav boxes all the way around here. So, you know, I can see the wind is 255 degrees at nine knots. That's the, um, that's the average one, I believe. And then down here, you can also put in these same similar type of uh, icon with the glider and the two wind arrows here showing where it is relative to you as you're flying. I'm gonna talk more about this picture in a few charts down, but um, that's basically what you see. There are some great videos of Hawk in action. Uh, these are also on the Cumulus Soaring's website. Uh, there were two actually by Tim Bromhead in uh, New Zealand. Uh, one is him setting it all up and another one is him uh, actually flying with it. Uh, Rudy uh, Schlesinger in uh, Austria has got a really nice video of him flying in the Alps with it and some great shots of him flying along the ridges and whatnot. That's worth seeing just for the scenery alone. And then Adam Woolley uh, is a competition pilot down in Australia, he put together a nice video showing how to do a lot of the various settings. And if you're familiar with any of the LX systems, there's a, there's a tremendous number of settings. It's a fabulous system because it has so many options and that can be overwhelming at times, but once you get used to it and understand it, it's really an amazing uh, system. So Tim Bromhead here, he had, like I said, he did these two videos. The first one is him just getting it, what's in the box, how to set it up, how to uh, put it in your glider, things like that. The second one is his question starts with, was it worth it? Is it worth it? And spoiler alert, it is. So anyways, that's a good video to watch. Uh, Rudy's trusting there is uh, flying it in uh, Austria. Now he only had the, S10, I think he had an S100 actually in his uh, S10 and S100 are the same. The 100 is the larger version. The S10 is the smaller uh, two inch version, 50 millimeter version of the Vario. And uh, you, know, like, you can see here some of the scenery of him flying over the Alps, which is really cool because he, he's flying along these ridges and you can see how the wind is, is uh, changing as he's flying down the valleys and over to the ridges and then favoring a ridge for him to fly on and then actually getting a lift. Pretty nice. And then I'm Adam Woolley. This was very helpful to me in trying to go, through, try to understand some of the setup features that are, uh, you know, the parameters, if you will, that are in the, uh, in the Hawk, sorry, in the LX9000 system to set up for Hawk. And there's a whole lot of new Hawk features. As a matter of fact, um, they're, they're, uh, I'm on the beta group where we're getting new software all the time. I just downloaded some new software the other day uh, into my glider. And so they're continually upgrading it and learning from the experience. And, and that, that's one thing I really like about LXNAV is that they're never uh, standing still with what they have. They're always trying to upgrade and trying to improve. 
Then in that uh, webinar I was mentioning, something very interesting that I played around with later when I was in uh, Parowan actually in June is or some of the um, things that Tony Sabank was talking about. You can actually go into the parameters and vary while you're flying this what's known as SIG wind, the significant wind and the turbulence type. And you can fly in a very, you can set it up for a very smooth day or a typical day or a turbulent day. Well, we were flying in winds that were never less than 20 knots there. Very rough. Um, and uh, I, I played with this a little bit. I cranked it up to these higher settings. And yeah, it seemed to help. I really haven't got a lot of experience with that. So I can't tell you how good it was or not, but it did seem to help. I had some great flights and I was glad to get out of Parowan and that, that uh, really strong wind and get back home and put it to the more typical setting that I fly with out in, uh, in the Sierras and Tatchby and whatnot. Then there was a, a um, blog by Wings in, on the Wings and Wheels website. This one was done by G. Dale. And if you've ever seen any of G or read any of G. Dale's books, they're fabulous. Uh, you can get them at Wings and Wheels. I think there's four books now that he's written. And I've, I only have the first two, and they're really, really good, very well written. I've seen a couple of, you um, can also go on YouTube and just put in G. Dale. He's got some great webinars out there that you can just watch for free. And uh, very well spoken, English pilot, very experienced, and he's uh, he really breaks things down nicely. So here's some of the things he said. Now, I'm sorry, but I'm going to kind of read some of this. It said, uh, I've been using Hawk for a while now, and I've noticed something I've been completely fooled by much of the wind shear within and around thermals. I thought I got it licked, but it turns out that I had, hadn't, haven't understood it at all. So further down, he talks about what he was feeling. Basically, he said that he's feeling the gusts, the side gusts, that the total energy probe will show as lift when it really isn't lift. And I'm sure a lot of the expert pilots, you know, they've been at this for a long time, have a way of, um, you know, they filter out what they can feel in their, in the seat of their pants as a gust and, and not go for it. But I was always having the same problem. I would see my Vario going up on my, that was, this was back when I had just the TE probe. And I would try to turn into what I thought was a thermal and couldn't find it and get frustrated and leave. And uh, it was very irritating. So the hawk is so simple. You wait until it says you're going up fast and then you turn hard right into the thermal and you can't miss. Now he said you can go the wrong way, but what I found is that hawk is giving you the instantaneous wind and it's worked for me very well. I just turn into the instantaneous wind and I'm almost always in a thermal. I don't think I've missed it more than a couple of times. And uh, maybe with, if it's a weak thermal, you know, you might have a little trouble or if it's a really, really narrow one. But for the most part, turn into the wind, you got it. You got a thermal. So this translates into wasted fewer circles. And if you go on to um, you know, analyze your flight at the end of the day and see you, you always have that one where it says the... Um, number of missed turns. And it's nice to get that ratio way down because that means you didn't waste any of your energy, you didn't waste any time. And I've noticed in my flying that since Hawk, those numbers have come down for me. So I'm very, very pleased with that. And Morgan Hall made some comments. These are a bit dated now, but this was back in May, June timeframe last year. And basically he says, this, this is a game changer, it's a vario. And, um, you know, Doug Fronius, I think you and I have both seen that great video or uh, presentation that Jeff Byer did of the history of Varios. Well, this now is the new history. This is the latest one that should go on that same presentation. Um, it matches the seat of the pants, what you feel, which should. Never really thought of that. Of course it should. And it's interesting when you watch the, you can display both the total energy probe compensated needle as well as the hawk needle. It's amazing what you see. You'll see that you'll, you'll feel a bump and the TE probe will show it's all kinds of lift and the blue needle of the hawk will just not show anything. Then vice versa, you go along and you hit a bump and you feel it and sure enough, the blue needle goes way up and it's a good thermal and you roll into it and eventually the TE probe catches up. 
So, you know, this, so this is what he's saying. A surge would show instantaneously on the hawk, and it would take time for the TE vario to catch up. So eventually what I did is I turned off that crazy uh, total energy probe. I don't even fly with it anymore because all it was doing was just confusing me and, and you know, giving me what I felt was a false positive uh, reading. And then he says how the uh, in convergence hawk has got much more true to feel. And I'll talk about that. I've got some, an example of that further down. Yeah, the next chart. So this is a flight I had last year coming back on Final Glide to um, Mountain Valley. And if you look at my display, go around the, the map here, uh, my target is Mountain Valley. Average wind 150 degrees at uh, four knots, not a lot of wind. Uh, JS, that's uh, Jim Staniforth. He's on Florham and he's just ahead of me. He's shown right here. Can't really see what he's doing. That's his difference in altitude to me. He's going up uh, at 0.2 knots, so he's hitting a little bit of something. But he's kind of out of this purple range. And what is this purple? This purple is the convergence that is shown on the sky site um, forecast. And you know, in the morning, we can put up all of the forecasts for the whole day, load them in, and go flying. And it's got them all in cache memory. So this was at uh, 1600 con uh, time frame. And we're not right now in real time. It's local time is uh, 1611. So it's, a, it's right, on, right on cue here. Uh, what's interesting is that when I'm in this area, the wind turbines are over here near Cache Peak and Three Sisters. They're, they're all in this area here. And I could look out and see where they were showing an east wind. And I could look over into the right side of me coming from the west and I was seeing the onshore wind. Uh, Walt Rogers likes to call that the, um, what does he call it? Uh, not blowout. Uh, gosh, I can't think of the word he uses now. But uh, the onshore winds are what create the normal convergence that we see here in, uh, in the Tatchby area. So it was definitely coming. I could kind of see the haze when I was out here. No clouds, but I could see the haze. So I thought this is going to be interesting because the right now the hawk is showing winds kind of matching what I'm seeing in the wind turbines over to the left of my path. And you can see where I'm at. Closest airport is uh, Kelso. And I'm 12.7 miles out of Mountain Valley, 1600 local. Uh, by the way, this is tracking up, so I'm headed south. So then a few minutes later, I took this picture. So look what happened. The winds are now out of the west. And sure enough, I started feeling some activity in this uh, in this convergence. And I can't really see what's going on with Jim here. He's still looks like it's a negative number, so he's still not really going up. There really wasn't a whole lot of lift in here, but there was definitely convergence happening in this in this regions in this region. And then I also took a picture of the um, the V8 Vario just to see what it would like would look like. And and you can see the two arrows are matching essentially same thing I have here. So to be honest with you, I never use this display anymore. I just use this display over on my LX9000 with the relative winds being right to my glider and just leave the vario on all the various variometer parameters. I tried this um, over on the right-hand side. I tried this uh, nav box that Adam Oli uses and it's this huge variometer that he puts right in the center of the screen. I, th I thought, man, that's going to be great. I hated it. It's just in the way of everything I wanted to see. So I don't use that anymore at all. But um, it is it is kind of interesting that you, you, know, you can see everything your Vario is doing right there in front of you on the big screen. But it, it's covering up too much for me. So I went all the way down south and then turned around. Now I'm down over Double Mountain area. So on the south side of uh, Mountain Valley Airport, here's Mountain Valley Airport here. So I'm due south of it, south of Dill Hill. And I'm looking back at this area of convergence that was shown in the sky site uh, forecast. And you can see it's flipped over to this 1630 uh, forecast. It changes every 15 minutes and 45 minutes after the hour. It changes to the next uh, 
the next uh, forecast, which is a, uh, top of the hour and 30 minutes after the hour. And I'm in a little bit lift, not a lot. But what was most interesting was I turned around and took this picture. Nothing. Not a cloud on the sky. So it, both SkySight and Hawk together accurately were showing the convergence that I saw and felt and flew through. But there were not any markers at all. Now, granted, this was not a really strong convergence. Usually when it's strong enough to uh, really... Uh, really go a long way or, or or fly very fast in, you'll most usually have clouds, but not always. But um, I thought this was pretty cool. Not one cloud in the sky, but there was definitely convergence there. So total energy probe just shows energy. So it will show a gust is positive lift, the red needle. And it's fooled me many times, as I've mentioned. Hawk seems to always show accurately where the lift is of the blue needle. And the total energy probe will often show lift and Hawk will show, uh, will not show anything. In real lift, Hawk reacts faster and then the total energy probe eventually will catch up. So I, as I mentioned earlier, I've just turned off the red needle. I flew with it for a while. Uh, Tony Sabon kept telling me, you know, he, he was telling me, it costs you nothing. You should just use it. And well, it's confusing. I didn't like it. So I turned it off. And I've noticed that my uh, thermal tries in CU has decreased as I was talking. And uh, I wouldn't say no more, and it's a little bit bold, but certainly a lot less false positives. Now, since all of these um, earlier videos were put out, there was a fairly recent one done by, again, by Heinrich Meyer and Tony Sabak, and they did one season of Hawk use. And it's also on... Uh, Paul Remdy's site. I think you have to be a Patreon to get to it, but the free one is right here on, uh, on YouTube. And it's really interesting. They talk about a lot of things about uh, what they've learned from using it the whole year. And it pretty much matches what I'm telling you now, but it's good to hear from them because they're the, they're the experts. But um, I would say overall, it's been a pretty remarkable uh, experience and I've enjoyed it very much. So here's the websites that I mentioned, and I think there's going to be, a, I think Christopher's going to be able to publish this for me, just put it all out, or it's going to be on this, the recording here as well, so you'll be able to uh, uh, search on all of these various websites to see what I've been mentioning. Yep. So with that, I'd like to open it up for uh, questions, comments, or I'm sure there are a lot of other people that have been using Alex uh, Hawk this last season or so, and, and maybe you've got some insight that I didn't cover that I'd like to share. Yeah, like just anybody who wants to chime in, please go ahead and do so. Yeah, so can you clarify, um, this is Bill here, um, the the Hawk, that, that's it's software, right? It's not a device, is it? It's just software that plays on the LX? Uh, yeah, Bill, it's software. Four or five? Um, if, if you're beyond four or fifth generation on the LX 9000, it will work on any generation S10 or S100. So I didn't get into that, um, but I will just real quickly. You know, the that's why you're seeing a lot of LX9000 third generations for sale on the used market. <laughs> and I sold mine to uh, uh, Mark Grubb, and he he has a, a what's a, called a butterfly uh, Vario, mm -hmm. and it does a it's pretty much similar to what Hawk was doing. Um, so for some time unfortunately you can't get those anymore they're out of business and it's just another system to put in your glider so i considered that and unfortunately it's got a not only does it take up space on your instrument panel it also takes up quite a bit of space on the back side of your panel and it would not fit for for me so i didn't do that and i didn't want to buy something that's not supported the beauty of the hawk system is that it's completely supported uh you know currently by the uh, lx nav system system and company but yes it is just software to answer your question and now so i used to have an s80 in my ls3 which is i can't remember the difference between that and the s100 but uh I it was, it was a 80 one. millimeter what i don't think it'll work with the s80 okay i think you'll have to upgrade to an s uh, s100 that would fit that same hole yeah I got a I got an air glide, which I think is the 
Well, air glide is is if it's that butterfly air glide, it's, that's it's the butterfly you all the thing. same thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, you got Jim's old glider, yeah. That he had right, I do have Jim, and he was always like, <laughs> "Oh, the wind is fantastic on this; it's always great." You know, so it is. It yeah. is. It's really good. Well, you know, funny story. Uh, back at the last Reno convention, I was talking with Tony, and back then, uh, you know, several years ago now, uh, air glide was pretty popular. And I told him, "Why don't you guys do something like that?" And he said, "No, no, ours is way better. You don't, you don't want all that." You know. And then he kind of was winking at me, and I go you got to do something better. So I think this has been in the works for some time. It's a little different. And, and I, to be honest with you, I don't know all the specifics. I've just been told that, that it is different in the way the uh, it's using inertial measuring unit compared to the air glide. And that's, that's all I know. So the IMU is part of the LX 9000 or the it's built into the. It's built five. into the, into the S 10 and S 100. And in the later generation, LX 9000s. With an LX 9000, you have to have a V8 or a V80 uh, variometer to go with it. So if you, in my case, where I had a third generation uh, LX 9000 with a V8, I would have had to have either bought a, uh, I didn't have any room for either, but I would have had to have bought an S10 or an S100 and just had it stand alone and have Hawk or sell everything, start all over. And that's what I did. And that was a pretty nice experience. It was other than the amount of money I had to spend, but uh, I, I literally swapped it out in less than an hour. It didn't take any time at all. All of the, all the connectors uh, were exactly the same. I just had to take one out and plug the other one in and poof, I had a hawk. And what did the whole kit together run? Mm, just short of seven thousand dollars. <laughs> okay. Ouch. So, yeah. so that's so that begs my question to you, Dan. Um, let's just say for giggles, um, I wanted to get this installed into a Grobe 103 twin. Um, and you're saying that you can buy the S10 or S100 and it'll work with those standalone. Yes. What would what would be the investment and and what would you think it would be work? Would it work still be fine or work if I found and had room? Because I do have room in our club uh grove. There's an empty uh uh panel, empty spot on the panel. Well, Is they that... would work great. Um, a lot of guys use these as a backup vario. Matter of fact, if you look at some of the top pilots, you know, they're flying the LX systems. They'll have an LX9000 or 9070 with the uh, smaller uh, V8 Vario, and they'll have this as a backup as well because it's a standalone. It's a logger and does everything. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, the way I arranged my cockpit or my uh, instrument panel, it um, I just really didn't have the room for that. And I would have had to incorporate new wiring and new harnesses and all, you know, mm -hmm. uh, circuit breakers and things like that. And... I just decided to bite the bullet and put it back the way I liked it. Hey, Dan. But yeah, this Doug? would. Hey, Doug. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Um, I think this is an answer to Christopher's question. Do you recall how much an S100 is today? Mm -hmm. uh, it's... I just, Dan. I'll look it up. I just put one in my label and Clint oh. put one in his, and it was about 3500 bucks, and it's pretty well plug and play. Okay. Um, uh, you know, just, you know, positive and negative, you're, you're done. Right. And, yeah. and it, it fits really nice. It's a nice unit, nice setup. I did have some problems with my new, uh, Becker radio and making noise and stuff. And I'm still kind yeah. of playing with that. There'll be some RF noise and stuff that'll mm -hmm. kind of screw it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But that's, that's more of an install issue in a, extremely small lapel panel so yeah i uh, flew with it last sunday and everything was knocked on wood pretty flawless and um yeah really a game changer i've only flown with uh you know leftovers from jeff byard so uh yeah this, <laughs> this is kind of a huge deal <laughs> yeah, had a pellet Justin. with one pellet yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> the pellet you can't see so I'd yeah, put that it. pellet in as a backup. You know, you might need it someday. I do. Um, <laughs> hey, hey, Bill, your your question earlier, the S80 doesn't work because it doesn't have an, an IMU built in. Yeah. 
It had so a Josh, it, it had an attitude indicator I could pull up, so it had something. But okay. I guess I'm, I'm just amazed that uh, you get an IMU in that little thing because you know my airline well, experience IMU is a big thing. You know, it's a yeah. and that's one of the things that. that uh, that's one of the things that Dr. Meyer points out. He said the reason that we can do all of this is because of the um, tremendous uh, processing capacity we have in such small space now. So, you know, technology is really, uh, really helping us. The question I have for Josh is, uh, Josh, did you, have you tried this yet? Have you tried a Hawk in your new uh, yeah. S100? Yeah, my last few flights, they've all been wave flights. I can't find a thermal this time of year out of Shafter. Um, <laughs> I tried, bad. but they're rare. Um, I landed in Tehachapi on Sunday after launching out of Shafter, and it was a good west wind, you know, and you get the convergence there. And I was just playing with the wind stuff while I was getting ready to land, and it literally kind of pointed me kind of towards a direction. And then I look up, wind in the clouds were making this perfect shelf convergence, and it's like <laughs> that's where it is. <laughs> you know, the way, right? it, it was, was a little nice. confusing before that and then you kind of follow the the needles it it is a game changer deal i think and uh, along with the sky site um downloads you can do even on your phone it's uh, that's it was a blue wave day on sunday mm -hmm. and uh granted i was a little nervous of causing trouble with all my friends uh retrieve wise but um that mapped out the wave situation, all the wave bars very, very accurately. So we're, we're, we're entering into an extremely easy way of soaring, I think. Um, so yeah, this is, it's a, it's a neat setup. Um, but in the wave, it's a little different because if you're just sitting there cruising in the wave, you're not making any heading changes. And I've heard that mm -hmm. it needs a little movement for for the system to work properly. Um, there was a tumbler wave set up and I was kind of right over the clouds and it was going down. The wind indicator was saying it was going down the wave wave bar and I it didn't make any sense to me. And I don't know if it, that, if that was um, problems I was having with some RF interference on it or whether it was um, a problem with <laughs> the algorithm. Um, but in general, I think in thermals, it's going to be, yeah, game over. Watch out. <laughs> it's 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 really oh, been yeah. amazing. Whether it's um, worth 3500 bucks, my buddy Clint bought one right after I did to keep up with the Joshes here. And <laughs> I felt a little guilty, but he went and flew with it. And he was just like, I hate to say this, but it's worth $3,500. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I caused several guys to go off and spend, uh, you know, just north of or just south of uh, seven thousand dollars. And well, that's uh, the game in soaring. <laughs> see how much you can make your buddy spend, right? <laughs> hey, Josh, I have a question. Sorry, yeah. uh, Christian here. Um, you were mentioning noise from the radio. So, does the radio interferes with a with a uh, with a S one hundred or? Yeah, what I think what it was doing was. Um, the S100 gives you about 10 feet of GPS cable. Okay. Uh -huh. So where do you put that? I wrapped it up in a loop and everything and behind the label, everything else was wrapped up in a loop, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, what I did basically to fix it was put the GPS antenna in, you know, behind me mm -hmm. and stretch out that cable. And mm -hmm. that seemed to work really well. What would happen is I transmit on the radio and the GPS coverage would fall out. And then once that happens, that screws the algorithm up. Uh, so now that the hawk needs to refigure out where it's at, and yeah. and it, it takes a few minutes to do that. Oh, oh. So, yeah. There've been there've been some uh, concerns with some of the guys with the self launchers that have um, uh, single stroke, uh, two stroke, I should say, uh, engines, mm -hmm. in that they have so much vibration, they're causing some issues as well. And at Parowan, we saw that there were some um, DG 800s that were there that were trying it out on their S100. And until they shut down the motor and and uh, started soaring, it you know it would finally damp out and everything would be good. Well, that's yeah. easy. Just I don't have that. Yet. That's yeah. Well, I don't have that problem with the little wankle in, in my uh, SH31. It works fine, and and that's 
that's exactly what Dr. Meyer said. He says, well, I've got ASH 26. It's no problem. Or 25. He says, it's yeah. no problem. <laughs> so, hey, Dan, is I, Jim I, Hurd here? Dan, do you copy Jim Hurd? Jim, how are you? Yeah. Um, let me comment on this because I have that exact problem. I'm one of the three that Dan um, was helping at Parawan, and I have a DJ 800. Um, there's no doubt there's a problem here for some gliders with engines that vibrate. I think it's depending on how much they vibrate for sure. But what it does is it messes up the sensor, the AHAR sensor, and then it will not recover. At least I left mine on because what it does is it causes the AHARs to tumble. It's all over the place and the Vario's banging off the needle up and down, up and down as you're climbing out with the engine on, right? Just when you need to go find a thermal. So I left it like that for a couple of flights out of Parawan. And literally, one time it took two hours and it eventually found itself. Another mm -hmm. time it took four hours and it eventually righted the AHARs and then the whole was working correctly. So I, I learned that what you had to do was use the total energy pro, turn Hawk off, in other words, to take off, climb out, turn the engine off, then convert back and, and convert back to using the AHARs. That worked. So then I've been talking to the LX nav guys about this and kind of a bit a bit annoyed about it, right? So they've actually made a software change. They did this last year and I'm pretty sure I've tried it and it does work. So what it now does, when that problem happens, it automatically restarts itself after the engine is off. So that's a kind of an improvement, but it still isn't any help for climbing up with the engine on because the AHAS is all tumbled and the needles all over the place. So it's still not really a full solution. Uh, the only way you can do it, if you have that problem, is turn Hawk off, climb out, turn the engine off, put it away, then talk, turn Hawk back on again. That's the current status. And I don't know if they've fixed it any more since last summer. Well, they've come out with, uh, I think, two or three different, I'm on the beta group, I think we're up to the third improvements since last June, since I saw you. And um, I don't know if it's, <laughs> they're not real uh, open about some of the things that they're improving. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a bug, it's a feature. You know, the, it's kind of <laughs> <laughs> One thing I noticed if I tap on my altimeter, you know, to get it, to keep it from sticking is the Hawk Vario jumps. So it is pretty sensitive. Um, <laughs> So I don't have a motor in my glider. I can't afford it. So <laughs> keep that one in the tow plane. You got a tow plane. <laughs> Two. Too many. Cool. Okay. Are there any other questions for Dan? You know, Terry Honickman uh, wrote me an email today. I don't know. Are you still on, Terry? He's there. Yep, he's still here. Yeah. Um, the question that Terry had for me was, um, is this legal in competition or will it be legal in competition? And the only answer I could have for him is that, well, the butterfly barrier has been out for some time and it hasn't been, um, you know, disqualified or I don't, you know, at least not to my knowledge for people to use in contests. So I don't see that this one would be either. Uh, is it an advantage? Yeah, it sure is. I think so. So. It yeah. wasn't so much is it legal as is it sportsmanlike or unsportsmanlike. Uh, <laughs> who cares about that? <laughs> <laughs> I, so, but I do have another question for you, Dan. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Uh, please, I, I've had two flights with the Hawk now, and on one of them I did find some convergence, and I think I have an idea about how to use the the uh, the blue the the real wind the instantaneous wind needle uh, to stay on the energy line, and I, I'm looking for some guidance. How do you use the Hawk arrow to stay on the line that you want to be on in convergence? Well, if you like the pictures that I've shown, if you're seeing that you had it uh, immediately flip around, you know you're in the convergence. So typically what's happening is that air mass is moving. And in my case, it was moving from the right to the left, west to east. And you would want to go further downwind till you 
till that seat till the lift ceased yeah. and you, know, you got to be careful with that especially if you're you know like my other glider 126 uh, you don't like going down <laughs> very far at all <laughs> but um you know, typically you have to go downwind from whatever you're seeing to get to where the wind will then hit a different air mass. That's about the best way I can describe it. So even when I was flying on that, let me get to that picture. So uh, right here, uh, you see this here, obviously the wind was from my left. So I was going to have to go to downwind to hit any convergence, or in my case, I just went straight to where it was more uh, filled in, and that's what I did when I was further down here, and it it switched around. So, you know, I guess it. I'm not sure how to answer that, Terry. It kind of depends. I know in uh, at Parowan, I was flying under a whole lot of clouds, and I was using the uh, convergence uh, forecast from SkySight and Hawk. And you know, I'm looking out and I'm seeing clouds everywhere. I go, okay, well, where's the convergence? Which, there's gotta be something in here. And sure enough, there was a, you know, kind of a wandering line of convergence. And I started following that and it was working very nicely. And, it, and these arrows were, you know, switching around on me side to side as I was working my way down through the, uh, you know, through Utah <laughs> coming back. But um, so I don't know how better to answer. Try to keep the arrows lined up with the axis of the airplane. But you know, maybe uh, and south of Warner Springs, we have several sets of uh, windmills, and sometimes as you fly down, you know, the windmills on on one side are blown from the east, from the other side they're blown from the west, and the ones in the middle aren't moving at all. <laughs> And those are the ones you want to lift is. That's where the lift is. Right. So, so yep. that's where you want to, you know, use the arrow to say which way are the windmills blowing, you know, yeah. up, up there, I guess, right? So well, we, we see that all the time in Tehachapi and out into the uh, in the desert down towards uh, Mojave and, uh, and that and that part of the Antelope Valley. There are a lot of times that I've been out there and I haven't been I didn't have enough altitude to get back to Tehachapi, and I just look at the windmills and see what the go to the ones that aren't moving. And the ones that are going opposite directions, and the ones that aren't moving are right in the middle. You go there, and poof, you're up, you're going up. But we don't always have windmills around, do we? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no windmills out in Antelope Valley. Sorry, because I. Uh, that's, you're not in your part of Antelope Valley, but you're. No, fine. not that part. Not not yeah. right now. No, and we have the that you know the the blue convergence uh, you know throughout the summer and. Um, you know, it, it's it's a crapshoot to find it. Well, not totally, but it can be. Um, so, um, but I'm not. I guess with the Alex Nav alone, I mean, with the Hawk alone. Um, well, let's just say from what you're showing us, it it's great to be able to have the Alex, you know, uh, display and the, the Hawk together. And as as the two together, you you can't miss. <laughs> the two together and using SkySight. Are, yeah. are just really really nice yeah. and um got all the toys yeah great <laughs> you only live once you know <laughs> yeah 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 okay mm -hmm. well if there are no other further questions i'm going to turn it over to bill palmer for a moment to talk about his porch chat on february 8th go ahead bill all right so i'm going to take a look at the uh, thermaling we'll take a look at the uh, theoretical models of thermals and then try to have a discussion on how do we center there's a, a lot of different centering methods i just did, i did a video a couple of weeks ago about it uh you know uh different ways of basically all doing the same thing trying to figure out how do i move my circle to where the thermal is and uh, and do that how do we how do we think about it what are we looking at uh on the vario and the seat of our pants and whatever so Right. I'll present what what I found, and uh, as I found in my video, other people chime in and go, "This is how I do it," you know. So this is how I think about it. So I'd like to see sure. uh, everybody else kind of chime in and the way that you uh, uh, center on a thermal and how you conceptualize it and uh, correct for it. Sure, sounds very good. 
All right, so that's February 8th is our next porch chat. Um, so let's say again, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dan. Uh, very excellent presentations. Your presentations are always spot on. So I appreciate your putting this together very much. And as mentioned, it will be uh, on YouTube in the very near future. And then what I'll do as far as his, um, all these nice links and websites, um, I have the PDF of that. I'll send that out to the same email threads as well as it'll be on the tehachibigroups.io. So I'll, I'll post it over there momentarily later this evening. So you can take a look and travel on over to the Tehachibi Groups uh, website and find it there. Um, and then of course, you know, it'll be on the, on the YouTube channel, on uh, YouTube video. So thanks all for joining. Good to see a good crowd. And thanks to folks for joining in again. Take care. And until next time, stay soaring and fly safe and stay warm. Take care. Thank you all, guys. Take care. Thank good you. night. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Dan. All right. Bye. Mm -hmm.